everybody registered in the class will have access to it. And the reading list, I don't have a syllabus, but there's a reading list that's been posted on that site. Okay. And we'll use it for posting various things as we go through, through the class. And any questions from last time? So, remember last time I gave a broad outline of all the stuff that we're going to try to do in this class, starting from a very mac micro sort of framework and then going, building it up and discussing a variety of problems as we build it up. And it turns out a lot of things uh, we can discuss with a pretty simple orientation, although uh, a little complicated, and some of it may not seem so simple, but it, it's pretty simple. We'll start out with a really simple analysis today, uh, analyzing investments in human capital, uh, and looking at the re investments by parents in their children, maybe in the household, uh, maybe uh, in school, I'm not going to, I won't have to distinguish that. Uh, at, for much of the analysis, eventually we'll make some distinctions, okay? And we can consider, and we will consider investments in both the intensive and extensive margin. By that I mean, you know, as you increase the amount of human capital, education, for example, that you, your children have, um, as you increase the number of children, how much you invest in them, those, both those types of issues we'll be able to discuss in a straightforward fashion. So, and some of the questions we're going to try to discuss is like inequality across families, across cohort members in their human capital, and which is, we'll see in a, will be the determinant of their earnings. Okay. The underclass, so so-called so underclass. Uh, that is, uh, families that have trouble getting out of the low income poverty, um, I don't want to call it a trap, but poverty uh, syndrome, and, and more generally the role of family background in the transmission of earnings from parents to children. Okay. Why there may be underinvestment in human capital, and where and when and under what circumstances, because if there is, and you can see the immediate role for social policy, even from an efficiency perspective. I mean, if, and we'll have to define precisely what we mean by underinvestment or not, and then see what that implies about efficiency, and we'll be able to discuss that question. And what type of income inequality you would like to see, well, we're not going to try to discuss that, uh, especially, I and mean, that depends a lot on what you put in about uh, some preferences or some other characteristics over inequality. So we're not going to really discuss that, but we will be able to analyze what determines inequality and is the amount of inequality we get is efficient or not, and if not, in what dimensions. So that's a very important set of problems, and that we can we, we can deal with. Okay. The way we're going to model this, basically, is parents invest in some kind of general human capital of children. And when they become adults, children then invest, build on these, these general investments, so they'll be very important, and then invest in more specific forms of human capital. Like they may become a doctor, or a teacher, or an engineer, or a carpenter, or a nurse, whatever it may be. Okay? Uh, and so we'll have late, early and later human capital will basically be complements in, in the analysis. We'll start out with the early human capital and then move to the later human capital. Um, although investments in early human capital are contingent on expectations about later, and we're going to suppress that aspect of it at first and get into it uh, eventually. Um, one can distinguish knowledge, cognitive skills like IQ, non-cognitive skills, <coughs> such as whether you get to activities on time, do you do your homework or not, um, you cause problems in class, uh, things of that type. Okay. 
Uh, now, Heckman, in his work, has stressed, uh, and, and many of you are familiar with, the, the, the two types of skills, non-cognitive and cognitive, and how they interact, particularly in early childhood. You know, how cognitive tend to get formed earlier, and non-cognitive later, although still relatively early. Uh, we're, we're going to abstract from that problem in some sense. Uh, we're only going to deal with one type of human capital. Well, cognitive and non-cognitive can be inputs into that, but we're, we're really not going to have production of cognitive and non-cognitive. I mean, Heckman has, has dealt with that extensively and very effectively, so I'm, I'm going to abstract from that. I'm going to say a little bit about it. All right, so how are we going to do it? Well, to start, we'll assume that each adult has only one child, there's no marriage. So later, we, of course, we want to introduce more than one child. That's a decision that families make, and we want to talk about marriage, and we will. Uh, but at the moment, you, it's called sometimes a unisex model, that there's only, you know, it's just adults. We don't distinguish their sex, gender, um, and they, <coughs> an adult can reproduce children, um, and we'll assume they have one child, so we don't initially look at that reproduction decision. There'll be only, to start, only, I'm making a lot of simplifying assumptions, if you, but it's going to be interesting how far we can go in some dimensions with these simplifying assumptions. We're going to have only two periods of life, childhood and adulthood. They're going to be homogeneous, each of them. Okay? And parents have children at the beginning of their adult period. So by the end of their adult period, parents die and then children become adults. So it, it's an overlapping generation model of a particular form. So here you have parents they time T, they're adults, and they have one child. P plus one, child is an adult, and the parents die. So parents equal zero. That's what I mean by they die. Okay. So T plus one, child, adult. So they overlap for one period. When the child is a child, the parent is an adult. When the child becomes an adult, the parent has died, and the child has the, the child who's now an adult has a, has a child. So that's an overlapping, what's called an overlapping generations model. They've always been very important in demography and in, in economics for the last number of decades. They've been utilized for a, a number of problems, and they're very uh, crucial to talk about intergenerational issues in particular, which we will uh, be getting into. All right, so then parents. At the beginning of this adult period, have a, they, they, they have one child, so we're not uh, uh, allowing them at this stage to choose <coughs> how many children, including no children. Sorry, we're not allowing them. They each have one child. Or, and they have to decide, but they do have a decision, a very simple decision. They have a certain income, which is given to them, uh, determined by their human capital, which, is each, uh, which in turn was a function of what was invested in them when they were children. So it's a recursive sort of relationship. But they have to make the decision how much they want to consume for themselves and how much do they want to invest in their children. That's the only decisions they have. Okay. As we elaborate the model, they have more decisions, but this is what they have now. Okay? So parents. Either CP. Or I'm going to call Y, Y C. Okay. <coughs> if they subtract, spend more on children, they have to subtract from their own. So you're going to have a constraint. C P plus Y C is equal to Y of parent. Which is W of parents is parental income. Now by writing it in this way, I'm assuming. And I'll define YC equals goods spent 
on children, parental consumption. So, they're in the same time units, so I don't have any prices associated with YFC or CFP. Well, it'll turn out there will be prices even in this, shadow prices even in this simple analysis. But these are the same stuff. You have like the total amount of stuff, like cons consumable possibilities. You can devote some of it to... Um, that your children <coughs> affects the human capital or you can consume it yourself. So a one sector model. Okay? Even though there are two different things being produced, own consumption and expenditure on children. Okay? Now there's no way, one <coughs> crucial feature to recognize about this is there's no way that children can later repay their parents. I mean, it's by definition in this two sec in this two period life cycle model, because when the children are adults, when they're making some money, the parents are already dead, so they can't repay them. So this, may, this brings out very starkly a more, much more ge general issue that uh, it's very difficult to contract by parents with their children so that the children repay for the investments. In this case, there's no way, fee, there's no way that they can repay them. Impossible. Okay. Now they can be nicer to them and so on. I don't have that in this symbol. I can easily bring it in. I'm not going to have that. Right? So kids can act nice to you and so on. Of course, they may be acting nice not to repeat pay, but to get you to spend more on them. Right? There's a, some fundamental conflict uh, between parents and children. Right? Now, if there was a third period, old age, which we will introduce, then repayment technically is possible. Uh, when children are adult, their parents are old, and the children transfer resources to their parents. And we know in most societies throughout history, uh, children took care of their parents. And even in modern society, even in the United States, which is considered the most nuclear of all families, still a, a good fraction of children help out their parents, with, mainly with time, but also with money when the parents get old. Okay, and if you look at China or India, uh, Latin America, mo most parts of the world, that's still quite important, more important than in the United States, okay? But we don't have old age, so that's not possible, even technically possible. And, it, and even when it's possible, it, it's, it, it's difficult, contractually difficult. So we'll go into those contractual problems somewhat. Now, if you had selfish parents, who didn't care about their kids, and selfish parents, the optimal Y is equal to zero. Why do you spend anything on kids? No way you can get back anything. You're just giving away, You're just reducing your own seed. So selfish parents don't spend anything on kids. If the world was full of selfish parents, we could close up this part of the analysis and go home. Right? So it has to be something that induces parents to spend on their kids. And I'm going to call that altru altruism. You can call it guilt, obligation. I mean, you have a lot of names you can give it to. I'm going to call it altruism. So altruistic parents care about kids. Now we'll see, if they don't care enough, they still may not spend anything on them, but still they care about their kids, okay? So, once they care about their kids, parents may be willing to spend a little or a lot on why and investing in, in the kids, uh, because that improves somehow the situation of children. We'll show what I mean by that in, in just a moment, okay? Um, and how much they spend will be determined by how altruistic they are, parental income, and various other characteristics which we will want to discuss. Any questions at this point? Okay. So, 
Now, how are we going to do it? Well, first of all, we have a budget constraint here. I'm going to assume a utility function of parents. The utility function of parents is going to depend upon their earnings. That's the, um, the only variable we have. And the utility they get is, will be indirect. The indirect utility will depend upon their earnings. And the utility they get will depend upon their own consumption. What does this equation say? Well, C of P we already introduced as parental consumption. W C equals earnings of children. When adults, not child earnings. We're not really going to have any child earnings or it's going to be netted out of everything, so uh, we're not going to worry about it. But it's what they would earn when they become adults. So we're, we're, what we're assuming here is that parents' utility depends upon the utility, depends on the earnings of their children when they're adults, and parents get some utility from that. I assume that's rising in, in WC, so the D, 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 WC is greater than zero, and it's concave. Don't strictly need concavity, but... Uh, so it's diminishing marginal utility, where A is equal to the degree of altruism. So A equals zero, parents are selfish, they don't care about their kids. And then you can have A. A could be anything. It could be three. I mean, it depends on the, of course, the U and the V functions, but it could be, you know, you could be very altruistic. You may be willing to sacrifice a lot in order to have your children do better, or you may just be only moderate, modestly altruistic. I mean, the evidence is that, you know, most parents like their kids <coughs> to some degree. I mean, degree varies among families, and a degree varies even within a family, within a child. Maybe you like them at some point, and they do a lot of things. A could be endogenous, in other words. Altruism need not be just taken as given. Well, I'm mainly going to be doing that. I can't get into every issue, but it, it, people have tried to endogenize, like Casey Mulligan in his dissertation here, um, endogenized a made a function of various characteristics of children's behavior and the like. Uh, but I'm just going to assume it, it's given, but it could vary from child to child. You have more than one child, and certainly it could vary across families. And Dean will show that uh, variances across families tend to get correlated. That is, differences in altruism across families get, tend to get correlated with other things. So. Uh, income, higher income people will tend to have, be more altruistic. Now you might say, well, why should the rich be more altruistic? We don't assume that the rich are more altruistic. We assume the more altruistic, we'll show that the, as a theorem, the more altruistic are more likely to become rich. Um, and so the fact that the poor may not spend as much on their children may be partly a result of lower degrees of altruism in equilibrium, but may also just be that they're poorer, so they, they take, have less for themselves, they give less to their children. That truly is the, probably the first order of effect that we, we, we are observing. Okay. Now let me emphasize now that often when one thinks of, go back up to this budget constraint up there, often when one thinks of investing in children, one thinks of time. The time you spend investing in, in your kids, right? Um, but, and we'll get to that, but at the moment, we're assuming that the way you invest in kids is just through goods. You, 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 
spend some goods on your kid, and that uh, affects them. We'll show how that, that affects them. But you, we want to, at some point, separate out the time component, since it's so important in, in investing in human capital, and we will do that. Okay. So, given this property here, parents are concerned about the earnings of kids. Now, we're going to have we're going to have to relate earnings of children to things their parents do, right? The parents are doing Y, spending Y. Now, what parents are concerned about is not Y but W. So for parents who want to do Y, there must be a link between Y and W. Okay, and what kind of link? Well, I'm going to have it in two stages. On the one hand, I'm going, now, now we come to, a, to the name of the course, human capital. Human capital of the kids. So I have a very simple function, Y. So it's not depending upon any other characteristics of the parent. This is household production function function for human capital. So a lot of human capital is produced in the household. You think of this as school, then this would be a school production function, but then it wouldn't really you want to think of it only depending upon parental inputs. And we're eventually we're going to get to other input. So you could think of it as, as a school. I just think now we're just dealing with a narrow version of, of the school. Um, okay? And we're, we're going to assume that D is greater than zero or greater than equal. The more you put into the child, the more you put into the child, more human capital you get out of the child. Okay. Not surprising. In a limit one case, it could be not no effect. And we're going to assume that you have diminishing returns. But you could have you could also have zero here, so that you could have constant marginal product of investing in your kids. For example, you could have a function like HC is equal uh, to K, Y, C. This would be a case with, with this no diminishing returns. The marginal product would be D, A, C, D, Y, which would simply be K. We could have that. Uh, you could even have increasing returns up to a point. Uh, uh, that's perfectly possible. And indeed, you, you would think in reality, in some intervals, particularly when you're investing a little bit in your kids, maybe just investing a little doesn't give much human capital. You have to reach a, a, a minimal point at which you're beginning to get something, right? So if you spend, uh, think of a, a school, you spend a half, a half hour a day teaching reading, you probably can't, people don't learn anything about reading. That's all that's going into it. Okay? So you build up. So maybe the function, if we look at HC as a function of Y, maybe it's something like this like this, and then like that. So it's convex in this region, zero here, convex, and then diminishing return. I'm going to concentrate on, on the region where, um, or it could be linear, so that's not a region. Not on this increasing return region. So that parents push into the region of diminishing return. Not strictly necessary, uh, for, a, for maximization, as we'll see, but uh, I think it's generally, it, it, it's a realistic view. Think of it this way. You have a, a child, um, and they may be developing and so on, but you have a child and you're pumping information knowledge into the child. Well, the greater the rate at which you're pumping this knowledge into the child, the at some point, the lower their ability to absorb that knowledge, right? And we, we all know that from our experience in learning. So that's, that's why the diminishing returns eventually seems reasonable, because you have a fixed brain, so to speak, 
they say, think of the brain. Okay, you, want, you, you want to think of it more formally? Think of it this way. B, brain. Let's say B is fixed, although the brain is developing, particularly for young children. Let's say B is fixed. So maybe this function has constant returns to scale and Y, and, and B may be even increasing return. But holding B fixed, you'd expect at some point you're going to be really having diminishing returns from Y. Right? So this derivative, now that's why I'm using the partial derivative notation. This derivative, we say, is positive, but now you might think negative, or oh, I'll leave the case of constant there as well, okay? You see that? Any questions? So this production function is going to be very important. So you have to understand that. Um, it's going to be important because, first of all, even if we make no further changes in it, it, um, it tells us something about what the optimal investment is, as we'll see. Okay? So even if we don't modify this function anyway, uh, it's important. But it's also important because as we extend the analysis, different families may have different uh, functions or different arguments. That, for example, the production of children human capital may be affected by parental human capital. It's not unreasonable, more educated parents are better producers of knowledge for their kids and less educated parents. So you'd want to bring that in. And, one, and that gives you a heterogeneity across families that here we don't have from the production function alone. In this case, the way I've written it is the same production function for all families. That's what I'm going to assume to start. All families have exactly the same production function investing in kids. We know that's not true. So at some point we have to modify that. We will in a lecture or two. Okay? Probably next lecture even. Uh, so, so, and that will, therefore, that, those differences in the production fund will be determined, in part, will be determined why different families invest different amounts in their kids. That's why it's so important. And why some invest a lot and some invest a little. So this is a very important property. Um, it's part of household technology, so, so to speak. And um, it, it becomes a, a, a crucial part of, it, I think, any serious analysis of parental investment in their children.
individual household, we can assume R is constant. Because my investment, to, since this phi function depends upon the sum of the human capitals of everybody in the society, and there are a lot of people, and if I change my investment in my kids, that's not going to change R. It's going to be a trivial, a drop in a bucket compared to the total human capital in society, right? So every parent, therefore, can legitimately take R as given to their decisions. Collectively, the parents will affect R, but each parent separately takes R as given, and that's important. It's a competitive assumption that this market is competitive. Now, you may have many types of human capital, but still, even, uh, say, doctors, any one person's investment in becoming a doctor doesn't affect the uh, earnings of doctors, right? Or carpenters. Almost, I mean, it's hard to think of a skill. It may be a skill where only three, uh, ten, or three, or four people in the field, and then it will affect it. But, I mean, that's not relevant for the vast majority of the economy. Okay. So we take R as given. Uh, parents take R as given when they maximize, when they make their choices. However they make their choices, they take R as given. That's given to them by the market environment they're facing. Okay? All right, so now we're set up with the problem. Parents want to maximize U, P, function. W's and w, of WP. Similarly, determination of parental generation. This R may depend upon the generation. I'm not going to, going to put a subscript next to it uh, now, but in general, will depend upon you know the generation that's involved. Okay, because it will change as technology changes, as total investment changes, capital changes. It will change. So from this point of view, from this point of view, why do, why do people's earnings differ? Golden, Sean, Golden, I see you here. Yeah, why do people, why do earnings differ? Yeah, that's the only variable there is. Since R is the same <coughs> within a core, then the only reason they differ is they have different amounts of human capital. This is, so this is a human capital interpretation of earnings differential, which I think is a good, to a first approximation, particularly, well, to, I wouldn't even qualify. To a first approximation, earnings are determined only by human capital. Now. Maybe earnings are determined by whether you're in a trade union or not that raises wages, it's not competitive, or government uh, po political pressure that leads government to pay more, say, to their workers. So <coughs> to second and third approximations, you certainly want to bring in some other factors. But when it, whenever you bring it in, certainly human capital is going to be a major determinant. So you look within the government sector, the more skilled people get paid more. Look within the private sector, more skilled people get paid more. Okay, you look within the unionized sector, more skilled people get paid more. The gaps may differ by sector. Uh, so unionized workers generally have lower gaps between skill level and earnings than in the non-union sector, for example. But still, human capital is an important uh, determinant of earnings, even when we go to these further approximations. So we're, we're going to deal throughout most of the course with human capital as the sole determinant of earnings in the following sense, that this equation W equals RHC will hold, but R may be a function of economy-wide type variance, and will be in general, so that we will allow. Okay. But still, when I say human capital will be the only determinant of earnings, I mean this equation will apply. I mean, I could extend it and modify it for a 
for different conditions. It's no problem, but we're not going to pay much attention to those modifications. We maximize this subject to the budget constraint that we have over there. Parents take WP is given, right? So we have two variables, max Y and C of P, Y of C. And so what do we get? So we get that um, this is a little u, u prime, <coughs> the apparent. So we set up here. Let me let me do it. Uh, do it. Stage. So we set up some uh, like range that we're going to maximize. Then u of p minus lambda times c of p plus y of c minus w of p. And then going through the maximization, we would get um, little u, u prime of c of p is equal to lambda. Okay? And then we would get a, now we differentiate with respect to y, but y enters here, so we first let's first write it this way, a v prime of w c. And I'm going to write less than or equal to lambda. So this is the. I'm I write this more correctly. D, D, Y, C. Okay. Less than or equal to lambda. Uh, so this is the marginal utility you get from an increase in Y, investing in children. I write less than or equal to allow for the possibility, which I'm going to eliminate shortly, but allow for the possibility that uh, less than zero implies y star of c equal to zero. That is, if you're not getting enough utility from spending on your kids relative to what you can get from spending on yourself, you wouldn't spend any on kids, right? So give me an example. Where that would happen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, when your earnings could just be exactly at your subsistence level. Well, uh, yeah, you, you, maybe very low earnings. Uh, A equals zero. Clearly, A equals zero will happen, right? Uh, if A is equal to zero, and it's not as clear from this equation. This term is zero. This presumably is positive. You get marginal utility from spending on yourself. So that would be one case. But it's not the only case. What you're pointing out is not the only case. If this term, even if big A, if this term is sufficiently small when y is zero, then that could also apply. Yeah? So if, if r was zero, right? Well, if, yeah, if r... If, our, if that means yeah. if human capital is useless right. and WP <laughs> is zero, I mean, we're in a, right? Yeah. Everything is zero and we're in a zero world, yeah. But that's kind of an interesting case. Uh, you're saying that nobody has any resources, so they can't spend anything. Okay. But maybe low R would be relevant. Right. Okay. Any questions? All right, so now we can write this condition. Let's rewrite this. A, let's just do, you know, brute force. D, V. V is a direct function of W, C. W, C. And D, W, C, D, H of C. Then D, H of C, D, Y of C. Right? We can decompose this term here. And so we have that less than or equal lambda, where <coughs> this is now A, V prime of C. What is this? R. R. And what is this? Right. F of y or F prime. I'm going to call it now F of y. And that's less than or equal to lambda. Right? Right? All right. Now, what is this? 
Well, that's the change in W, C, E, Y, C. Right? There's a change in W, so there's a change in H. H, change in H times R is a change in W, C. And this I'll call 1 plus the marginal rate of return on investments in kids. Okay. So we have the condition now, just, just rewriting it, but it's useful rewriting. A, B prime of C, and I'm going to call this, let's call this R of Y. Lambda from this equation is equal to u prime c. Okay. So this is looking very familiar, and it is a, a, a familiar condition. Now, so if we look at this marginal rate of return, little i, that's going to be determined by the properties of f y, f double y. If f double y, the second derivative is zero, then i little i is going to be a constant. So i constant is f. Uh, uh, I'm just showing you, I'm using the same notation. So if you had this linear function I wrote someplace, I mean, uh, not up here, but anyway, I wrote it someplace, um, then that, that would be zero. If we have f double prime, that implies that d little i, du y of c is less than zero. So as you're pumping more uh, resources into your kids, teaching them more, you, you get lower rates of return. That's all we're saying. Okay. That also means then that under these conditions, but more generally you're going to say drc, ry, dy see, is less than or equal to zero. Okay. Or we can write this in a pretty in a more familiar way, R of Y less than or equal u prime of c of p over a v prime of c. Okay. This, in a sense, is the marginal rate of substitution between the uti uh, utility parents get from their own consumption and the utility parents get from their additional consumption, really, the resources of their kids. And that's related to the marginal rate of return. That's a classical you know, uh, arbitrage condition between the consumption choices over time. This is today, this is over future. So we usually say the, the ratios between the pre margin utilities of consumption today and consumption tomorrow is equal to one plus the interest rate. That's what we have here. Okay. We have, so far we've kept the inequality uh, to show that we may not be uh, relevant. All right, uh, that we may be at a zero point. All right, so we can make this an equality. I'm, on, I'm going to deal with the case where this is an, equal, uh, an equality by assuming that A is always strictly positive. So if we assume that A is strictly positive, and if we assume, but sometimes call it, and not a condition, that as you lower your investment, and you make your, for very small investments in your children, the marginal rate of return is very high. So if you look at the plot of the marginal rate of return, and why, we're assuming that this goes up very high. That means for very small investments, 
the marginal utility that you get uh, gets very high. It's very high. And therefore, you're going to make some investment. So these, these, these two assumptions imply that Y star of C is going to be greater than zero. Maybe small, but it's going to be greater than zero. Of course, you get kind of infinite margin utility if you're just investing an epsilon amount. <coughs> So you're going to do it. Not a bad assumption. There are very few parents in the, in the world who don't do a little investing in their kids. There are some. They kill their kids. I mean, parents are known to kill the kids. They abandon their kids. But for the vast majority of parents, even parents who are not that caring, they do some investing in their kids. They feed them. So on. that's an investment. Right? They give them shelter. So. I'm going to make that assumption. But once we make that assumption, then we can say these assumptions apply. If y is going to be positive, then this becomes a strict equality. And I'm, that's what I'm going to use for most of the analysis. That you do uh, invest something in your children. It's, um, you're not at such an extreme position where you, you, you don't care about investing anything. And to the extent there are a small fraction of families there, we can, have, we can understand those families as well, but I'm not going to pay much, any attention to them. They're not the majority. I mean, they're not only not the majority, they're a tiny fraction of all families. Okay? So, now when we look at these conditions, we say, well, what's going to determine how much investment is made in the kids? Well, it's going to be the rate of return. Is it very productive to invest in the kids? The more productive it is, uh, other things are the same, the more human capital the kids are going to end up with, uh, how much utility are parents getting from their own consumption, how altruistic they are, what's the utility, margin utility they get from additional uh, income of their kids. These are the determinants of, of the amount that's actually invested. What, how parents divide um, their total income into own consumption and investments in kids. Okay? Now, you indicated that may be a, how that division is maybe a function of income, right? Poor people may divide it more, I mean, I don't know what their shares is, but the absolute amount certainly is going to be less, we would think, for poor families than for rich families. Maybe the shares are even less. Well, that's something we'll have to, have to analyze. So before I do that, are there any questions? All right. So graphically, the picture we have is the following. Maybe this will help. Us. Suppose we put along the axis C and Y. Then under given conditions of F and R, parents will have some utility and difference curve system. This is the utility function, the big utility function of parents, right? Not some indifference curve system between the two. And they have a budget constraint. The budget constraint is Up here, right? So let's say this is their budget constraint. This is WP. So this is WP. If they put all their resources <coughs> either on kids or on themselves, they go to the um, axes. And their optimal is this. This is the optimal division. So this would be, let's say, C hat. And this would be y star um, equal to the gift. This is the gift that parents make to their kids, right? This amount here, this is what parents consume. So that's how, in this case, how they divide up between the two. It depends on the uh, indifference curve strongly uh, between them. And the indifference curve, in turn, will depend upon some of these productivity effects, right? But uh, this would, 
this would be an example of how they would make that uh, decision. Okay. Parents, in principle, could go here. Under what conditions will parents go here? They had vertical indifference curves. Right? And that may be because A is zero. And it would be uh, that most plausible explanation that would be A equal to zero. Vertical indifference curve, in, uh, utility right, rising to the right, so you go here, you go to the corner. Right? There could be conditions under which you'd only invest in your kids. Although that's un unlikely because, again, the marginal utility of own consumption here will tend to be pretty high when you're consuming a, a little. You know, maybe you need a minimum amount of consumption to survive. And therefore, uh, unless you're beyond that point, you won't invest anything in your kids. So, what, given these equations, this, and let me rewrite the other one. Let me, I'll do it differently so I can rewrite this. Equal to what? 
going to be Michael minus new double prime over some determinant d equal to the following. Let's bring this up a little. Just the coefficients on the these two equations, and it would be minus u double prime one one over f of y, which is this term here. One over uh, this is one over f of y, and up here is a little more complicated. It would be a dr of y. A, well, what is it? A, dr of y, dh of c, b prime, plus a, r, v double prime, d, w, c, d, h of c. Okay? This is clearly greater than zero because maybe I didn't, wasn't, I should have been more explicit. We're assuming diminishing marker utility from own consumption of parents, concavity in this function, right? Uh, so that's positive. This term here is either negative or zero. This term is negative because concavity here, so therefore this uh, cross term in the determinant is positive. This is positive. So D, that's, that's really the second order condition, is positive, right? And therefore, we'd have positive over positive. First result, dh of c, dwp is greater than zero. And similarly, I'll let you work that out. It'd be good exercise for some of you. Similarly, we can show dc of p, dwp is greater than zero. So parents split. their increase in income between higher human capital of kids and higher um, consumption of their parents. Okay. Now another way to say this, parents, if they have higher income, invest more in their kids, spend more. Why? Why term? Spend more in their kids, right? Because the human capital of the kids rises, the only way that can rise in this analysis is for parents to spend more. Because human capital, recall, is simply a function of spend. So this is higher, this must be higher. Okay? Another thing we can say is that D, so here we've shown D, Y of C, D, W, P is greater than zero, and D, W of C, D, W, P is greater than zero. This is, this is interesting. Now, do you see why that follows? Samuel Kingsley, see here? Christopher Cray, is that, I don't know, that, that's, is he here? How do you pronounce your name? Craig. Oh, I got it right, yeah. Uh, now, can you get the question right? Uh, it's just why do those two things follow? Yeah, why does that follow? Very simple, not uncomplicated. Uh, what happens to human capital of kids? As parental income goes up. As parental income increases. Uh, human capital increase. Here. Yeah. Human capital increase. Human capital increase, what happens to kids' earnings? Uh, it also increases. Well, we have the earnings equation. <coughs> I've, read, I've written it down a lot of times. I don't even know. Uh, here, right up here. So if this goes up, and this is given by to any parent, this will go up. So it has to go up. So. This goes up as well. Graphically, we would have the following. I'm going to show this in a bunch of different ways. I'm going to leave this here. So let me write over here. <coughs> Back to our diagram. 
diagram that um, is what we have y along here, c and p along here. We have the difference curves. We have parental income here. And now we have an increase in parental income. Uh, that, doesn't, no, that doesn't look right. Why, why doesn't it look right? Does anyone see what's wrong with that? Because CP goes down. Uh, because consumption of parents are going down. I mean, that's, and I'll discuss that in a moment. Let me, let me do this first. New budget constraint. And then, so both Y is going up and C is going up. Right? So this is the U prime. After we have the increase in WP, this is WP prime. This is WP. And we have an increase in both C and Y. That's what's going on. Okay. Now we also have an increase when parents' income is higher, their kids' income is higher. Have any of you heard the term intergenerational mobility? What does it mean? Yeah? It means change in um, a child's income relative to their parents' income. For me, it tells you something about if parents are richer relative than average, are the kids richer than average? Yeah. Or on how much, right? Well, we're saying something about that. This says, if this analysis is right, this predicts that when parents are richer, their kids are richer. Richer parents have richer kids. So the basic property of a lot of findings in intergenerational mobility, which is namely that parents of higher income have kids who have higher income, uh, that is easily reproduced by this analysis. Okay. Now, it, there's a great deal of interest in the question of, well, how much higher? Let's say if parents are 10, 10, 50 percent above the mean of their generation. So let's say the mean income in the United States today, family income is about $50,000. Uh, let's say mean individual income is about forty. <coughs> let's say parents have an income of 60. So they're 50 percent above the, uh, let's say, uh, the, uh, the main earner has an income of 60 rather than 40 in the family, 50% above the average. Now we're going to look at their kids when they become adults. How much, uh, maybe the average income in their generation changes over time, okay? But we, got, we want to ask, well, how much, if, if the parents are 50% above average, how much are the kids above average? If they are, are they 50% above average, just as much as their parents? Are they only like 20% above average? Are they 60% above average so that they are more above average than their parents? That's an interesting question, right? I mean, you think, think of it from another point of view. If you think about equality of opportunity, in some ideal way, you would say equality of opportunity would be a situation where kids' achievements are independent of their parents' achievements, right? It doesn't matter how successful your parents are. There's equal opportunity, and uh, and it doesn't matter if you're born into a rich family or not. I mean, of course, that may affect your genes and so on, but let's put it very simply. It doesn't matter whether you're born into any family. You're just as likely to get ahead or fall behind as if you're born into a poor or rich family. That's an ideal of a lot of societies. That's all, all, always been an ideal of the U.S. society since it was founded. But it's not an ideal that's realized. Okay. There is considerable uh, connection between the income of parents and kids. Okay. On the other hand, there's also considerable what was called in the statistical literature regression to the mean. 
By regression to the mean, I would mean a, a general phenomenon. I'll go over these things a little more. The parents are 50% above average. Their kids are above average, but they're less than 50% above average. Maybe they're only 30% above average. So they've regressed like 40% to the mean, right? 40% to 20% relative to the 50 is 40%. Similarly, you can go the reverse way. If the parents are 50% below average, so instead of 40,000, they are earning, let's say, 20,000. I mean, you have to, I mean, pluses and minuses can make a little difference. Let's say 20,000, okay? So what are the kids going to earn? Well, they're going to earn more than 20,000, <coughs> at least relative to their mean. Maybe the kids are going to earn 30,000. So, and let's say the mean is still 40, so the kids now will only be 25% below the mean when their parents were 50% below the mean. The kids have regressed up. So it works in both directions, that the kids of the rich are not as, quite as rich as their parents, but they're richer than average. And the kids of the poor are not quite as poor as their parents relative to their, but they're richer, they're poorer than average. Those are very important characteristics of society. We'll see how far we can explain those characteristics. But you, you appreciate why that it's, it's, it's so important. It definitely explains like a lot of things that people talk about. Like, and like some of them like they just like, especially like when I talk with certain people, they just like talk about like the effects, but they never have any like solid theory behind it. And I think they have solid data. Probably not. <laughs> well, it's good to talk. It's easy to talk when you have to get a theory or data, right? <laughs> yeah, but the people discuss this a lot, right? And then the comparisons across countries. Is the United States a more mobile country than, let's say, Germany? By, mo by more mobile, I mean intergenerationally mobile, the different dimensions of mobile. And uh, we would say, which country has a uh, greater regression to the mean? Does Germany or the U.S. have greater regression to the mean? That's an interesting question to be asked. Or we look at, say, the U.S. versus India. Who has more or, or less regression to the mean, U.S. or India? I mean, India has come out from a long history of the caste system, where you're born into a caste, you stayed in that caste more or less, hard to get out of a caste. You would think in such a society, there'd be little regression to the mean. If you were an untouchable, if your parent was an untouchable, you were untouchable, and you did poorly. Right? If you were a Brahmin, you were a Brahmin, you did well. So you think those societies, they would have very little regression to the mean. What about modern India versus the U.S. or any other country, Japan? And so these, these are really important questions. And it's interesting that in the first cut of our analysis, that, that sort of variable uh, comes out. Now, I'm not saying we've answered the question fully by any means. We have it. But we, I think we put our finger on an important part of it. And all that we're saying <coughs> now is that when parents are richer, they spend more on their kids. Okay, that's a, uh, and that force is a traditional force <coughs> emphasized by economists. I think it's a very important force. So one way you see that is if you look at poorer families, particularly in poor society, take Mexico, not a, not a rich society, not one of the poorest developing societies at all. In, in rural Mexico, kids go to work very early. They drop out of school at age 10 or 11, 12, I mean, well documented. Now, why is that? Well, on one hand, you can say, well, the parents don't care that much about them. I think that's misleading. I don't think that's the main explanation. The other explanation is the parents are poor, very poor, and so they're, gonna, they're consuming very little, so their sh kids share in that. They consume little. How do kids consume little? They're taken out of school and put to work and help supporting the family. So raises family income a little, they share that, they give the money to the parents, and they still end up consuming little, but better than they would have if the kids stayed in school and the parents didn't have access to that money. So child labor is a product mainly of, of, of poverty in poor countries. The U.S., you go back to 18, you know, a lot of people in rich countries 
they say, oh, look at this terrible situation. These parents don't care. They put their kids to work at a young age. You go back in the history of any rich country, let's take the United States, go back to the 1890 census of the United States, and you'll find in the 1890 census that over a million kids are listed as working between the ages of 10 and 13. Listed as working. How many are really working and are never measured uh, is probably equally large. That I don't know the answer to that. The listed as working. That would be true in the history of every country. Uh, so, uh, poverty um, does I We had a student visiting from Hong Kong, graduate student from Hong Kong. And his history, his life history was really very interesting. At age 15, he had to drop out of school, more or less, uh, because parents, he had a brother, and the parents can only, is from China. It's, it, uh, He's now studying in Hong Kong, but he was from mainland China. His parents couldn't afford to put his brother through school and putting him through school. So he had to go out and work, work for seven years, saved enough money, studied hard, and then he became a graduate student. That's, that's an unusual achievement. That in fact, most of them don't ever become graduate students. They drop out of school and they never make it. He, he's un, unusual. But still, the dropping out of school is common. In, in poor societies and in a poorer part of the poorer societies. Okay? So we explain that, in a, at least in a basic way, in this analysis. Nothing to do necessarily at all with different degrees of caring about kids in terms of the A, could be exactly the same in all the families. This analysis, where we differentiate, we increase parental income, the A remains fixed. So it's not changing A. Altruism is the same. But you have these differences. Excuse Any me. questions? Excuse me. When you talk about the the regression to the mean in the U.S., this is a fact. Yes. Because there's all, it's also true that there has been like a huge dispersion. Right? Like there has been an increase in the in the differentials of the wages among the poor and the rich people. Yeah, it has been mainly due to education, other skills. But that, see, those are two different properties of inequality. One property is the inequality at, within a cohort across different individuals. There's no question that's increased a lot in the U.S., not only in the U.S., in many other countries. And in good part, as we'll see, because skill differentials increase, in particular the gap between the earnings of people of different <laughs> education levels increased. Okay? That is not telling us anything, not a zero thing about what the degree of intergenerational mobility is. You could have a huge amount of inequality, huge amount of inequality, and yet you completely mix up from one generation to the next who's on top and who's on bottom. Or you can have a huge amount of inequality and the same families are on top in each generation. Now, so technically, those are not related. Analytically, we'll show that with the analysis we're developing, they are related, but they're not the same, but they are related. But in principle, they're not related. One is dealing with the inequality of moment in time, the other is dealing with how that flows over time. And those are very different issues. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Um, I, I there is a degree, significant degree of regression to the mean in the U.S. There has been some argument, maybe that's gotten smaller over time. Right? That has been argued. Not that it's zero, it's significant still. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering what specifically you measure when you measure regression to the mean? Because with that, I mean, if, if you were if you were just saying... Oh, well, let me show you. Sure, okay. What we're measuring is something like the following. Suppose you're running regression. Log WC... Regression 
away from the meat. That the rich get richer and within families and the poor get poorer within families over time. So you're measuring H. Now, in a more sophisticated way than I'm just writing down this equation, but you're basically measuring H. And what really what mainly people do is they, they link the earnings of kids when they're adults to the earnings of their parents when they're comparable ages, correct for errors of <coughs> and they estimate age. That's really what's done. Okay? Any other questions? Now, my last thing I'll do today. What about capital market imperfections? Is there, are the rich spending more because of capital market imperfections? Let me define capital market imperfections for this purpose as different marginal rates of return on investment in children in different families. It seems like the natural way to define it within the confines of what we have so far. I'll, I'll extend that definition when we extend the model. But that's the right definition within this. So is this a consequence? The fact that rich kids of richer families have richer, richer parents have, have richer kids, is that a consequence of capital market imperfection? So to be a consequence, we have to argue it's a consequence of the fact that marginal rates of return on investment in kids are not equal. Okay. Now, it's easy to show in general, no, it's not a consequence. Take a very special case, which is consistent with our analysis. One reason I'm going to end the class is this is the size of the chalk that's left. So, <laughs> what happened? Anyway, I can make do with this. And um, yeah, I said it's not a consequence. Let's assume that f y y is equal to zero. F double prime is equal to zero. So uh, f is equal to k h. No h. I'm sorry. H. Yeah, that's true. But h. Ky. You get it right. What's the marginal rate of return in a family? Remember, we show the marginal rate of return is determined by R f of y. R. How does that vary across families under these assumptions? Anyone? How does it vary across families? The marginal rate of return will be lower for high income families, right? What do you think? So you say what the R varies across families? Or? Little R? Yeah. Same. I mean, that's a market parameter. That's, that's okay. Same. That F Y is the same in all families under these assumptions, right? So the marginal rate of return is exactly the same in all families, and they, nevertheless the rich are investing more. Has not, in that case, it has nothing to do with capital imperfections. Here, another question. Suppose you have diminishing returns. F Y Y is declining. I mean, you, the marginal product is declining. Where's the marginal return higher, in richer or poorer families? In poorer families. That would be a case where there'd be some room for, uh, if you had a more well-functioning capital market, what some of the richer parents would like to do in that case is instead of investing all their money in their kids, invest only some of it in their kids, lend it out through some financial intermediation and financial intermediaries like banks lend it out to the kids from poor families who then invest it because they get higher rates of return and they, they pay back the kids of the rich family. The kids of the poor families are better off, the kids of the rich families are better off. Of course, it's a very difficult contract to write. Right? Remember I said before, yeah, human capital can't be collateral, particularly among children, so how are you going to write that contract? I mean, it's hard to write a contract, particularly with five-year-olds, right, ten-year-olds, or even with others. They can't give their human capital as collateral. So that contract uh, is not written. So in that case, you would be. But the basic result we have is not due to capital market imperfections, that richer people invest more to meet human capital of their kids. Not basically due to that. As I took the special case with it, 
they're all getting the same marginal rate of return. Okay? All right. Uh, any last minute questions? You've been asking a lot of questions. Any additional ones? No. All right. So we'll pick up. You had a question? Maybe more indirect ways where these contracts take place, um, although it's, it's still tough to get the repayment. Usually, the way, what's happening with the rich and poor public schools, the rich people are helping to pay for the poor public schools, but they're not getting repaid for it. Right, that's, that's the resistance of property tax. I'm wondering if a market like that, if they get a return, there might be less resistance. Yeah, I think there would be a lot less resistance. Absolutely. It would be taxation, it would be an investment then, at least to some extent. Okay.